Hey, good morning. Uh, I think we're going to get started. Uh, so I'm uh, Brandon Silverman. Uh, I'm one of the I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of CrowdTangle. Uh, and just out of curiosity, how many folks in the room know what CrowdTangle is? Just raise your hands. Great. And how many people have never heard of it and are here just out of morbid curiosity? Okay, great. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do today is go through um, a few things. Uh, one is who we are and what we do at CrowdTangle, specifically some of the problems we're trying to solve for newsrooms and journalists all over the world. Um, secondly, uh, we were acquired by Facebook uh, at the very end of last year, and uh, I'm going to talk through what's been happening since then. Um, and then finally, uh, dive into a really specific example with local news. Um, and one context for this whole presentation, uh, so our team is based out of the United States, uh, a lot of the work we've done started domestically in the U.S., but has been growing a lot internationally. Uh, some of the case studies in this presentation are U.S.-based, but one of the reasons we were so excited about joining Facebook is the opportunities it meant for us internationally. Uh, and so one of the things we're looking forward to this year and the coming years is growing more and more around the world. Um, and as a part of that, actually the second part of this whole presentation uh, is going to be a case study uh, with uh, an awesome guest speaker from Velt N24 in Germany uh, and Asha Phillips from our team talking about how they use it. Um, so real quick, who are we and what do we do? Um, CrowdTangle's been around for about four years. Uh, it actually got started as a tool that was supposed to be used by nonprofits. Uh, and the original idea was we were, my co-founder and I were trying to hack the Facebook APIs uh, to connect issues and charities and nonprofits with their membership and their activists and their volunteers around issue areas they cared about. Um, I had spent seven years prior to this in the nonprofit world, and my co-founder had as well. Uh, it turned out that idea did not work at all. Um, but in the process of failing, uh, we were looking for lots of different ways to try and make it work and find things that resonated with our beta partners and early users. And it turned out one of the really big gaps out there was being able to see what was trending, what was working, what some of the kind of the best content and conversations were on social media. And that kind of slowly began the birth of what eventually became CrowdTangle. Um, so at its core, the basic problems that we're solving right now all stem from the fact that as journalists, as newsrooms, you're completely overwhelmed with data right now. Uh, most media outlets, most news, newsrooms are currently producing more content than they ever have before. You're more likely than not trying to distribute on more platforms than you had before. And if you're a journalist, you're oftentimes trying to listen to more sources and outlets than you ever had before. And it's incredibly hard. What we're trying to do in almost all of the various things we build is simplify all of those various processes in order to make it easy for you to use data to inform your work. Um, the goal isn't to have data drive your work. But if you're a newsroom, an outlet, a journalist, being able to make it easy so that data can inform the work you're doing. Um, we got started in the nonprofit world, but slowly began to be used by a lot of newsrooms. So leading up until the beginning of this year, we had the honor and privilege of working with a lot of great outlets around the world. Um, and in December of 2016, uh, actually got acquired by Facebook. Um, and one of the key takeaways, if I can leave you with during this whole presentation, uh, is that one of the reasons we were so excited about this is that prior to this, as a small startup, uh, we had a limited travel budget, uh, we had a very small team, uh, we had limited resources, we were scrappy, um, and there were a lot of products and solutions we also just couldn't build uh, because either one, we didn't have access to the data, we didn't have the time, we spent most of our time trying to sell deals, not build stuff. But by being inside Facebook, we're now in a position to be able to do a lot of things, including build a lot of products and solutions that we simply weren't able to before. Uh, and I think that's going to mean a lot of exciting things for newsrooms and for journalists over the coming years. So how are newsrooms using CrowdTangle right now? Um, the truth is there's a lot of different ways. It's turned out to be a pretty robust platform after three years of continuing to add things to it. But there's three I want to focus on today. Uh, one is discovering tor stories. Two is benchmarking your performance. And the third one is identifying your influencers. So discovering stories. Um, right now there's over 30 million posts per day that come from pages on Facebook. 
you may not necessarily care about every single one of those pages, but if you're a social media manager, if you are a content director, a journalist, chances are there's a lot of those pages that you do care about. And it's almost impossible to pay attention to everything they're doing. And that's to say nothing of Reddit, Twitter, all the other social networks out there. So at its core, one of the things we do is try and simplify and make that entire process really simple. This is a quick look at our dashboard. I won't go through everything here, but I'll show one thing in particular. Um, so what we do is let you follow all of the accounts you might care about. That could be your competitive set in a particular region. That could be third-party original sources like elected officials, candidates, government entities, et cetera. And we make it really easy to track everything they're doing. Um, and the one algorithm that's probably kind of the most widely used by all of our teams is this filter we call overperforming. And if you look at this number right here, I'll just go through this really quickly. This is a little in the weeds. Um, you can look at any post on any of the social networks we track. And what we can do is show you how every single post is performing. So this particular one from Fox 31, in this particular moment, this post came in one day ago. And if you look here, right now it has 146 comments. And that's 128 more than that outlet usually has after a day. So now if you're looking at any particular piece of content on all these platforms, not only do you see the raw number, you actually see how well that piece of content's doing compared to its average. And that helps you say, hey, this really resonated with the audience or this didn't. It can help you find things on their way up, on their way down. It can help you discover best practices, et cetera. So what are some of the ways newsrooms can use this? One of the ones that we got really excited about last year uh, was a small newspaper in Raleigh, North Carolina uh, that was covering Hurricane Matthew in October 2016. And what they did is they went into CrowdTangle and they actually added a bunch of emergency uh, governmental agencies. So they were city agencies, state, regional, federal, they were all doing things related to the hurricane. And it suddenly made it really easy for them to stay on top of resources that were available, shelters being built, food being distributed, and they were able to write and cover a lot of the hurricane by tracking some original kind of first party sources from first responders. Um, so secondly, so benchmarking your performance. Um, at an age when Comscore and Nielsen are no longer kind of giving you the metrics that represent where all of your content is being consumed, a lot of what we got asked when we were first starting to build this is can you help us compare how our social is doing relative to other folks? Um, so one particular example, we've started working with the BBC. We've been, not sorry, we've been working with them for a while. They have thousands of accounts associated with the BBC World Service. What our system does is make it incredibly easy for their team to see how all those accounts are doing compared to each other. And they can go, hey, the BBC page in Laos is doing amazing. The BBC page in X is not. We should work with them, figure out how to allocate resources, how to celebrate wins, et cetera. Um, so the last one I'll also focus on is identifying your influencers. Um, for those of you who uh, are kind of writing and producing stories, uh, this thing happens every now and then where you get a massive amount of traffic from Facebook and you don't always know where it's coming from. Uh, what our system can do is show you if there are large third-party social accounts that are posting links to your content and driving traffic. Uh, this is our attempt to make up a fake version uh, this is a random Midwest Republican senator uh, who posted a link to an unknown story. Let's pretend this is yours. Uh, it will tell you when people are posting links to your content and make it really easy to sometimes understand where your traffic is coming from. And one of the things we did, that, did with this that's probably our most popular feature is we turned this into a Chrome extension. And what this means is you can be browsing the web on your own content, on other people's content, and you can immediately see how many social interactions a story has and then literally what accounts across Facebook, Twitter, and even Reddit have posted links to that story, and then what they're saying about it, et cetera. Um, and this is really cool. One example of what you can actually do with this data is the Chicago Tribune uh, will take this, and if they see that somebody posts a link to one of their stories, they'll sometimes literally reach out to them and thank them for doing it, and in some cases form a partnership and figure out ways to work together because there's an, there's an immediate connection that their audience is interested in their content. Um, there's actually a bunch of stuff on top of this as well. Um, everything from kind of cross-platform analytics, historical data, easier reporting. Um, and the one kind of theme for all of this is that a lot of you or other people on your teams used to do all this stuff, 
but he did a lot of this manually. And thanks to a lot of the work we've done and the solutions we try to provide, we try to make this much easier. Our biggest joy is when we take something that used to take a social media editor two hours every week to do, and we can make it take 15 seconds on a Friday before they go home. Um, the other thing I think we focus really hard on is we know how busy journalists are. Uh, so what we do is rather than trying to give you another dashboard that you have to log into every day, is we try to deliver this content in a bespoke model that meets you no matter where you are. Uh, Slack really took off in the US. I'm not sure how much it is integrated into European newsrooms at this point. Uh, but we built a whole Slack integration where this, uh, all this news and content be de delivered directly to Slack. There's completely custom email alerts. You can get all this delivered directly to your email. Um, and the other big one is you can also put these up in big screens in newsrooms. Um, so that again, you don't have to log into something new. You don't have to change your workflow. You can try to integrate this data into the natural kind of processes of a normal, normal news day. Um, great, so what have we been doing since we joined Facebook? And this is, if I could leave you kind of a second kind of key takeaway from all this. One is that we're trying to solve a lot of different data problems for newsrooms. The second one is that we're able to kind of do more than I think we could have ever imagined now that we're part of the Facebook family. So what's an example of that? Well, the first is that within a month of acquiring it, Facebook literally just made us free, uh, something we could not have done before. Um, it was really exciting. This was a part of the Facebook journalism project and a big investment by Facebook to help provide tools for free to newsrooms around the world. Um, we're now onboarding around 60 new newsrooms every single week, a lot of whom are international. Uh, some of the markets in particular that we've been spending a lot of time on are India, LATAM, new places in Europe. Um, it's been really fun for us, really exciting, and all entirely possible because the, the tool is free now. Um, in addition, we, uh, as, because we're at Facebook, we're doing a lot more traveling to spend time in newsrooms all over the world. Facebook has been hosting local road shows in the US as a part of the Facebook journalism project, as well as some internationally. So literally in the first three months of being at Facebook, we've been to India, Atlanta, as well as Berlin, San Diego, London, Seattle, Dallas. These are all places where we're going, talking about best practices, onboarding newsrooms, showing them how to use it, and also hearing what new problems are out there that we can think about trying to help solve. Um, in addition to that, we're doing a lot of collaborating with the news industry. Um, so again, literally this is all in the last three months. We've done dedicated, uh, dedicated sessions and trainings for uh, journalism schools and college newspapers in the US, something we're gonna be replicating in Europe and internationally pretty soon. We partnered with Crosscheck in France uh, to help monitor some of their work around the French elections and we're gonna be replicating that in some of their other work, including Germany and uh, additional things in 2017. Um, we've been trying to be a, at a, an active presence in a lot of news conferences around the world, including this, as well as Publish Asia uh, and a bunch of others. Um, we expanded a, par a partnership with Chartbeat uh, to take our referral data and pump it directly into their newsroom, into their tool, so that it's easy to kind of take our data and make it again accessible without having to add a new dashboard for newsrooms to use. And then finally, we've also been doing hackathons. Uh, so we did two with Facebook in New York and London, and I don't know if this has been announced yet, but there's gonna be a bunch more happening this year as well. Um, so what does that mean? It means that we're impacting newsrooms all over the world and at a scale that literally wasn't possible uh, before we joined the Facebook family, and it's something our team is really excited about. Um, so the other thing we've also been doing is improving the platform. Uh, and a couple key ones I'll talk through, and these are again all things that have happened in the first three months since we've joined, is we did a major partnership with Reddit. Um, there is a lot of news, discussions, uh, communities that are actively engaged around news that are on Reddit. We did an exclusive partnership with them where we're now tracking more subreddits and more discussions faster than any other tool out there. And we've actually been working with the Reddit team to host webinars to talk about how newsrooms can use Reddit for their work. We also launched an entirely new tool called Intelligence. Um, this one designed to track long-term trends. Um, I think this literally went live maybe last week or the week before, uh, but something we're really excited about. In addition to that, um, and I don't know if all of these have actually been launched yet, so added reactions, this is not official yet, I think we're gonna be doing this announcement next week, uh, is we track full reactions across our entire system. Um, we've expanded the number of accounts we track uh, and how quickly, so we're now tracking every verified account on Instagram, every verified ac account on Twitter, 
and we're doing it faster than ever before because we're no longer rate limited on some of these. Uh, and finally, we're also specifically working to build better admin tools for large newsrooms. Um, so last piece I'll talk about is the work with local news. Um, this was a really important industry for us pre-acquisition, uh, but it's gotten even bigger since joining and is something our whole team is really excited about. So since January, we've hosted over 35 trainings for local newsrooms in the US. These are newsrooms that oftentimes don't have the staffing or the resources to be able to dedicate as much as some of the larger newsrooms. And so this gives us the chance to really have a lot of impact and simplify a lot of their work. Um, we've onboarded over 160 in the US, um, which means now we're in over 600 um, around the country. And this is something, again, where we feel like the US for us is just the beginning. And over the next half, we're going to try and replicate this uh, around the rest of the world. Um, and also, the, one of the reasons local is really exciting for us is they're able to kind of integrate this up and down their entire newsrooms. So when we get really deep with them, it's not only a place for discovering stories and benchmarking performance and all these different things, but it becomes a tool that everyone from the C-level folks are using down to the folks uh, doing the journalistic work every day. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll conclude with two final things, um, which is we've been working on CrowdTangle for a long time. There's now a lot of things you can do with it. And one of the most consistent themes we see is that the more newsrooms put into it, um, the more they also get out of it. And one of the things we spend a lot of time on is working directly with newsrooms. So if you're out there, if you're a CrowdTangle user, if you're not, we have an incredible accounts team that loves to get in the weeds, work with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis, set it up so that it's meet your exact needs and demands. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out to us. We love doing it. It's one of our favorite parts of the job. Um, and finally, um, we joined in January. It has felt like both a very short amount of time, but also a really long time. But in the end, it's only been just over three months, and we feel like we're just getting started. And so if you're a newsroom out there, we think we're going to be building even more powerful, even more robust things over the years to come, uh, and we can't wait to show you. So, um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Asha Phillips, who is our lead in APAC, and our guest, uh, Nidal Sala Eldon from Velt in 24. And they're going to talk to you a little bit specifically on, on how their team actually uses it. Um, so yeah, I'll hand it off to them. Okay, here you go. Or you might be able to just use yeah. those mics. Yeah. Okay, everyone can hear us, hopefully. Yeah, cool. So thank you, Brandon. Um, this is a great like intro to just having a chat about how one of our partners in Germany is actually using the tool. So I'm Asha, as Brenda mentioned. Um, I look after our APAC and in India um, partnerships for CrowdTangle, and I'm based in Singapore. And I'm here with um, Nidal Sala Eldon from Velt N24. Um, so Nidal looks after um, all of social media across around 18 or more various <laughs> verticals and brands um, within that division. Um, and so basically we're here to have a little chat and for you to actually get a sense of how a newsroom is really using CrowdTangle. And, um, you know, again, this is, this is not a sales pitch. We are free now. <laughs> so um, we're not here to kind of to sell you the tool. Um, but for those of you in the room who are using it, you may be able to learn a new, a new way to actually use a tool. And for those who are here not yet using CrowdTangle, hopefully this gives you some really practical insights into... Um, how you can use such a tool. Um, so I actually just wanted Nidal to introduce herself and talk a little bit about her background, and I'll also do the same, just so you have a little bit of context. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Nidal Salah Haldin. I'm the head of social media for Welt N24, a part of Axel Springer, which you probably know, big German media company. And um, I'm managing a team of five people in the social media team, and we're responsible for all different kind of, kinds of things. We'll get into that later. Uh, a little bit about my background. I study political science, communications, and journalism, um, both in Germany as well as in the US. I did spend some time there uh, in Washington, DC, gained some practical experience working for various television stations and online outlets. And after my studies, I decided to do a little bit of social media consulting and other consulting. And then I got the call from Welt, and then I said, okay, let's do this. <laughs> and then I 
I uh, went on to be part of the founding social media team, and I can tell you a little bit um, about that later, how we set up and how everything works in our great social media team. Great. Um, and so just for a little bit of context, um, so I've been with CrowdTangle for about a year and a half, um, but I'm a journalist by trade. I started my career in Australia in TV newsrooms. Um, and then I was the founding Asia editor of Storyful, which some of you have probably seen. There's a lot of ex-Storyful people around at the conference. Um, so my background really has um, come from the first traditional media and then moving into you know, using social media to discover content, to do a lot of verification um, around content that you're finding on social media, and then also to really understand how you can use it as a distribution platform um, and to grow your audience and learn from your audience and use that data not only to just drive decisions around what kind of content um, you should be using, but to use it to inform across the newsroom, not just within the social media teams. Um, so that's my background. That's why I'm very passionate about working for CrowdTangle, which is seriously an amazing tool. I used CrowdTangle as a journalist before I actually worked for CrowdTangle. So... Um, I don't say that it's a great tool just simply because I can work there and get paid to do that, but I've actually used the tool as well myself. Um, so okay, let's just talk a little bit about how you've built your social media team at Velt, um, because I know it's been a journey of around two years and you kind of have started from scratch. Just talk a little bit about how that's evolved. Yes, so the social media team at Velt um, has been around for two and a half years, which is not a very long time, to be honest. And before that, and this is the setup most of you probably know, our um, very dedicated and great online colleagues were responsible for managing social, a sort of a side project. So our editor, then editor-in-chief, Jan-Erik Peter, uh, Peters, decided to launch a team that is just responsible not only for distribution in social media, but also for building a community for um, doing consulting within the company to, and this is something you've mentioned earlier, this is so important, to um, have the social mindset around the newsroom. Not only one team that thinks social, but actually be evangelists for social media. So um, then we founded the team. I was uh, one of the founding editors of the team. And yeah, in the beginning, we had a big problem, actually. <laughs> we were talking about it earlier. Yeah. Um, our focus in my team is not only gaining reach and having great viral stories, but also taking care of our community, audience development in the very sense of the way. So um, you probably all know the motto, do not read the comments, don't <laughs> go, like d do not engage with um, people commenting on stories. And we sort of wanted to turn that around and be proactive, engage with our community, take care of the community, um, in both directions, both by disciplining people who did not um, cooperate and who were spreading hate speech and, and very un, yeah, unnecessary comments. This is the one side of it. And on the other side, we also wanted to make sure that we incentivize people to comment, to show them, hey, we do care about your story pitches, your story ideas. We do care about your feedback. We do care about your um, criticism as well, because that makes us better as journalists. So um, we actually started reading all of the comments, engaging with our audience, um, interacting with them from the corporate account under every single Facebook post, not meaning all of the single comments, but um, under every post. So um, it's been quite a journey, and it's been amazing to see how much you can, um, how much success you can have, and how you can turn everything around if you really decide to take social seriously and not have it as some sort of marketing tool to um, distribute your content, but if you really, really take care of your audience, you will see great numbers across the board, and I think we'll, get, we'll have the chance to talk about that a little bit later as well. Definitely. One thing we were talking about yesterday over lunch, which I think would be really interesting for people to hear about, is how you've helped build a reputation within the newsroom that maybe had a bit, a bit of a traditional view or was somehow still thinking of social as an afterthought mm -hmm. and how tools, CrowdTangle being one of them, maybe helped you um, 
you know, inform people around data and around how important it actually is to think about social and maybe think about it first mm -hmm. as opposed to a, an afterthought. Yes, so um, as I told you, our editor, then editor-in-chief, Jan-Erik Peters and Oliver Michalski, um, they are very active on social media, which is always great if you have someone from the top who understands yep. uh, the difference. scene. So uh, they also decided to have the team, and most of us were hired from outside. We didn't come from uh, within the company. And they had us do a stand-up every morning. You probably have this all in your newsroom, the big 10 a.m. stand-up with all of the heads of the desks and the editor-in-chief and their deputies. So um, during this stand-up, right in the beginning, after the um, news recap, the social team would speak. And this really, really helped us um, have presence in the newsroom, be recognized by people. And what we did there was give people an idea, help inform them, be evangelists, tell them, okay, okay, guys, these are the top five stories that we had yesterday. And then we'll call them out by name and say, okay, the sports desks did a great job yesterday. We had a couple of stories go viral. The politis, uh, politics desk or the opinion um, author, he did an amazing job and it worked really well on social. So if you want, uh, it's quite a, kind of a funny thing, journalists work on ego. <laughs> So, Who knew? <laughs> yes. And I don't know one single journalist, raise your hand please, um, that does not want to be read. Everybody that's in the room here wants to have an audience and be read, and not only in newspapers, but, but also in the digital audience. So if you have the data, and you can be data informed to know, okay guys, we had so um, reach, we had amazing interactions, we had... Um, so many social visits from this story, it's a great way to give people feedback and incentivize them and tell them, okay, you know what? It's being recognized what you're doing. So this stand-up that I was um, talking about, this really helped us because we gave um, a quantitative and a qualitative review of the previous day. And we were being very specific and we were also mentioning things that maybe we've missed. Yep. It's not only about like patting yourself on the back and say, okay, we did a great job. It's also about um, giving people an idea where maybe we can improve on or maybe there's some uh, hidden area that nobody's looking into. And data really helps you. It doesn't make your decisions for you. It's always going to be journalists and your experience that's going to be such an important um, part of this deal. But if you can make data-informed decisions, it's actually really, really helpful for you. So we embraced... Um, the tool CrowdTangle and also data in general in our okay. newsroom. Yeah. Let's go into the weeds a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm interested to know how your what, what your day looks like in the morning as you're preparing for the 10 a.m. meeting because mm -hmm. a couple of the features of CrowdTangle mm -hmm. allow you to look at leaderboards of your key competitors. Yes. So you could be looking at yourself as in comparison to any other German media or European-wide, but then also on the like individual journalist side you could have a look at all of your um, journalists and see how they're ranking comparatively mm -hmm. and kind of, again, as you're saying, get people a little bit excited, a little bit more competitive to see, oh, well, my story performed so well today and my Facebook post, you know, had a performance of 10 times better than average, mm -hmm. etc. So how are you using the tool in that way to sort of day by day get people excited? Yeah, so um, in my very small team, we have three shifts every day. The early, um, early editor starts at 7 a.m. And this will also be the person, that, that's the person that used to be responsible for preparing the morning meeting. So um, they will make sure that everything's in order in the community, that we have um, a current feed on Twitter, that we have published all of the uh, current events, and also on Facebook, of course. They will engage with our community. And then part of the job is, before the 10 a.m. meeting, to make sure that we have a social media report that we can present in our stand-up. So part of that report is, one, the review of our own content. What, what are our top stories that our authors wrote? What was um, particular about them? Was there anything that maybe um, had so, much, so many comments that we didn't expect on the story? Um, this is something that we will, we will tell them. Then, we always like to look um, and broaden our horizon and not only look at ourselves, <laughs> but also look what other people are doing. And it's not, in particular, not necessarily our comp direct competitors, but maybe some, some um, unknown news outlet somewhere in Canada had this amazing social story or they had this certain, um, certain perspective on a story that was amazing to see and we would have never discovered it if it wasn't for CrowdTangle, for instance. So we will look into what were some of the overperforming posts 
in, in the relative score, scoring. So I'll put in 24 hours, what happened um, in the past 24 hours, what of it was uh, overperforming, but also what was underperforming. Yep. This is what That's I was point. alluding yeah. to earlier. And do not only look for whatever, whatever went great, <laughs> But also look into, okay, wow, that's a story. I had expected it to go viral, and it ended up not going viral. Maybe the peak is over. Maybe that's a story that people have moved on from, so it's only going to work if you have like the new, um, the new outlook on it or the new element to it. So um, all of these things we will, we will um, put in our report, and then we'll present it. And um, in our team, we're very focused on interaction and interaction rates. So for me, it's not personally, it's not about, okay, what did CNN do? What did the New York Times do? Of course, these outlets are international and they have this um, amazing international audience. But CrowdTangle gives you the opportunity to look into the relative performance. So maybe one of the regional or local outlets you've never heard of had this amazing hit um, that did so well relative to the, to the usual performance of the page. And that says something. So it's not only focused on, on okay, how many likes in general, was it 100,000 likes, okay, that's amazing, but maybe the performance of a much smaller outlet with only 5,000 likes was much better if you, um, if you compare them. And I think this is a very smart and um, intelligent, yeah, it's an intelligent way of looking um, at social um, performance. And interaction rates are so important for us. And in our newsroom, and this is why it's so important that the social team does a stand up every morning, we have moved a little bit at VED uh, from the sh um, focusing just on traffic and visits. Um, in 2015 at VED, we've introduced the article score. And we have five factors that determine if, in, if the performance of an article is great or not. Because you can have a great success, great visits with a story that it's not very original and just like a cute story about something that nobody really cares about. But that doesn't really say anything. So we're looking into the visits. It's always important. We're not going to lie here. We all <laughs> care about reach. Yes. We're looking into engagement times. How many minutes do people actually spend on our articles? Because that says something. If somebody leaves after five seconds or somebody stays for, I've seen yesterday something, four minutes on an article, that is amazing. And that says something about the quality of the content that we have. Then the bounce rate. At what point do people actually just check out of the article? We analyze and track everything. Then social media. You can, in the morning report that you all of the editorial teams get every morning. You can only be on the top if your, social perform, if your article performed on social, if you have any sort of social um, activity. So that's important. And the video visits, because we've integrated uh, videos in our articles. We've bought a television station N24 a couple of years ago, so we have great video content that we try to include in our articles. So these fa five factors at VED decide if your article is successful or not, and social health um, plays an important part in that, and data and data-informed decisions for my team and for the whole editorial operation really help us to track these things and to deduct recommendations and to tell, give people feedback because we don't want to just be intuitive, and we don't want to just say everything out of experience. Experience is great, and we all need it, but my take on this whole thing is to have three things that you can combine. It's data, it's experience, and that last pinch of intuition that you need as a social media editor. So I feel like these th three things will make you, um, will have, it's like, um, are like the ground rule for making great social content. Yeah, and one thing you touched on as well is that you can use tools to see what's trending yeah. from competitors or you know, maybe it's a local news station in Sydney, Australia, or in mm -hmm. Canada, etc. But the idea is that you don't want to just replicate that content yes. and then mm -hmm. be a copycat. Yes. So how, how do you then use um, tools to actually see, well, if this has worked for an audience elsewhere, mm -hmm. how can we localize that? Yeah, so the keyword search helps us with that. We have okay. um, various lists on um, CrowdTangle. You've, you've seen the, the um, interface earlier. So um, if I want to find out what social temperature, mm -hmm. called a temperature in <laughs> Germany, um, a certain topic has, I'll just type in the uh, keyword and define 
right. a certain t uh, type of time frame, for instance, or a certain region, or like just the German competitors, or maybe international. And then I'll see all of the uh, postings connected to that very keyword. And if I see, okay, everybody has done the story, then I'll sit there and I'll be like, and then I'll, we talk a lot in my team and we, we um, yeah, we sort of try to make uh, joint decisions as well. So um, then we'll see, okay, this story, it seems to be over, like its moment has passed and it has reached its, pe its peak. And then we, many times, we decide, okay, we're not gonna uh, pursue that story. We're not gonna follow this story, and that's okay, because we've made a data-informed decision for ourselves. But how much time would we have to invest to look for it on Facebook directly, for instance? It would right. take you a lot of time to do that. So it's really helping us speed up our decision processes as well. What about in like a breaking news situation? Mm -hmm. Because often, I remember being in the newsroom, you just have no time yeah. to actually go to Twitter, go to Facebook, go to YouTube, do yeah. your searches manually. So how's CrowdTangle helping you automate that? Yeah. So um, in, when we have breaking news situations, and we've had many <laughs> of them in the past, yeah, in the past couple of years, <laughs> yes. Um, so we will make sure that we put out our content first. So there, for us, there's a great time for analyzing and for monitoring, uh, monitoring ourselves and our competitors. But if you have a breaking news situation, and I don't, I don't think I have to tell you this, you all know this already, it's all about speed. So people expect um, an outlet, and a, a renowned outlet, to be out there with the news. Yep. So we're not, we're not going to spend time um, pushing back a story, leaving it for 15 minutes, and checking what other competitors are doing. That's not our style. We have our own um, established way of uh, operation during a breaking news situation, and that um, has proven for us to, to work uh, very well. But in the follow-up of the news event, let's say there's a terrorist attack somewhere in Europe. So the breaking um, post, it has to go out immediately. We'll go on Twitter, we'll do live tweeting um, to the event. But then in the aftermath, you'll have many human interest stories pop up, for instance. And then, and we all know how well these tend to um, perform and how people really care about them. It's not all about performance. We also want to make sure yeah. we're portraying and, and, and depicting the reality and certain um, human stories about, about these events. Um, and, and what we'll do is we'll look into what, what, what did the French media, I did that the, the last time, Let, let's see what stories uh, we, we'll find in the French uh, media about this. And then we had so many stories come up that we were able to uh, pitch to our news team. And yep. um, our news team, it's not only the social team, I mentioned that in the beginning, that's also very important to me. Other desks... Um, have jumped on board, we, yep. we help them. I s just sent out an email this morning about additional lists on, on CrowdTangle because we want to make sure that the knowledge and the know-how is not only in my team, but also help other desks um, to work with the tool and to be independent also. And of course, we're always going to have, we're always going to be the social hub, and that's also, uh, also great, but it's all about um, knowledge transfer. Sharing. Yeah. Yep. And so actually that, that reminds me, you were mentioning there is 18, is 18 different verticals that yeah. you're helping manage mm -hmm. with social. Mm -hmm. So how, how have you rolled out CrowdTangle to all of them? And are you, does it still sort of sit really with you and your four sort of lead social people? Mm -hmm. Or are there key people in each of those teams that are the point of contact to actually run a search on CrowdTangle when there's breaking news mm -hmm. or to pull data in that way? How yeah. is it working? So um, the main channels are being managed by my team. So that's okay. VED and um, the N24 channel. Um, we've taken over in January. Um, but, and I think it's, that's a very good decision to make. Um, our editor-in-chief and his deputy, they wanted also to have the desks and people who maybe usually are not very active in social media to have touch points with social media and to sort of experiment with it and to know, okay, this is a great Facebook post and how do I um, uh, post a video on this page? So we do a lot of um, education. I do many workshops throughout the newsroom. I'll meet with the desks regularly. Yep. I do reviews. I think this is so important that you track your performance. And um, as an example, like one desk, I just did a review slot, um, um, session with them, the, our economics desk. They've launched a Facebook page. It's going uh, very well. Uh, great interaction rates, like 15% or something, which is awesome. And it's a, still a small channel, but we do review sessions. So right. um, I 
look at the things that are overperforming on that channel, and I'll look at um, underperforming posts, and I'll look at like missed opportunities, and then we sit there, we, we talk through the posts, we get uh, new ideas, we, we brainstorm, and I think this is such an important thing, that you not just, uh, as a social person, not just push out your content and just, okay, move on to the next thing, <laughs> try to, um, try to see the relevance and understand the relevance and the impact of reflecting on your performance. And you can do that on a, a qualitative level. We do that as well. But you have to look at the numbers. Because otherwise, you cannot learn from your mistakes and you cannot replicate the things that went so well for you. So I think it's a great opportunity. It's right there. It's making your life easier. And I always like things that make my life easier. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. As long as it's not an, an additional tool yeah. that's adding to everyone's workflow, yeah. I think that's the main thing, you know, yes. and, and you, you use Slack alerts as well, yes, and, and a email. lot of email notifications yeah. as well, which Because helps, we're right? doing so many things, we're not, as I mentioned in the, um, in the beginning, um, my team is not responsible for just uh, pushing out the content on social and then uh, do other things. We, we do consulting, we do community management, interact with our community, um, we do data analysis and monitoring everyone in my team, and this is, I, I, I tell that to the team all the time, we talk about it all the time. People are responsible for looking at their own posts as well. It's not only me. Of course, I do the, the major work and all of the sheets and crunch the numbers. Um, but everyone has to have the awareness and not be afraid of data. Like in, in my team, if you don't like numbers <laughs> and you don't like data and you just want to uh, send a click send and move on with your day, you're going to have a hard time. Right. <laughs> Speaking of numbers, not to put you on the spot, yeah. but can you share anything about how... Velt's main page or any of the other pages have actually grown. So I know you mentioned to me you've seen some pretty incredible growth yes. for social as well as your referral yes. traffic. That's actually true. So in the beginning, um, when we started, um, or we, when we started and launched the social team, uh, we had a very low social media traffic. We were at, I think, 1.7. Yeah, I, I was just looking at the numbers the other day. 1.7 social uh, million social media visits a month. 1.7 million. Back then, this was 4% of our total traffic. And just a couple of days ago, I did the review for March yep. 2017, and we were at 25, over 25 million social media visits a month, which Incredible. is almost 25, uh, 24% of our total traffic. So this is a great success for us. And of course, I, I told you, this is not only because we... Um, uh, um, moderate our comments. This is not only because we um, use data, it's the combination of everything. So we've seen growth of 1,400%. Um, and I have not spent one single cent buying traffic <laughs> on Facebook, boosting content. All of this is organic. Uh, this is all organic traffic. So uh, yeah, this, this shows us that it works if you actually just um, decide on a strategy and try to Review, uh, review your success and maybe adapt some things and really, really think about timing right. and know your audience. This is, I think, okay. if you take one thing away, <laughs> <laughs> um, know your audience and use tools to find out more about your audience. Because um, we have a totally different audience from CNN. You have to know how old are the people that we're catering, uh, catering to, what topics resonate with right. them. That doesn't mean that you just tailor everything to them and just uh, maybe not do politics coverage because you assume that they don't care about it. No, it actually does the opposite. It helps right. you. We know that our audience, for instance, they're not excited about cat stories at <laughs> All. Good to know. Dogs, dogs perform better than cats really? in social. This is my favorite fun fact to share with you guys. And our audience is really excited and, and very, very much engaged with politics coverage, for instance. Like they care about cur current events. So um, when you hear other people uh, talking about uh, social and cat stories and whatever, you're like, okay. Um, where did you get the numbers from? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of politics, I actually want to talk a little bit about the elections coming yes. up. So mm -hmm. all, all eyes on Europe, French mm -hmm. election, elections, German elections. So how are you using data or tools to actually help you plan ahead? Mm -hmm. Because a lot, of, a lot of what you do, I imagine, and what we do as journalists or social editors is look at day by day or historically. Mm -hmm. Okay, what did we do yesterday? What worked? What didn't work? And let's like maybe make a change. But let's look like several months ahead. How are you using CrowdTangle to actually plan ahead for coverage for such an event? And one thing I want you to touch on is 
the ability to, so within CrowdTangle you can build lists around whether it's your pages, your competitors or newsmakers, could be politicians, could be celebrities, soccer players, whatever, you name it. And I think one of the amazing things is that for elections, as journalists, we want to be able to observe what politicians are saying on social. We do not want them to know that we're observing by physically mm -hmm. following their page or interacting with them. Mm -hmm. So just talk a little bit about how journalists are using lists then yeah. to cover politics. So you all probably know that um, so many politicians and national politicians are on Facebook commenting on current events, doing content. They, most of them have their own social media and online people right now. This is uh, different. A couple yeah. of years ago, um, this was not non-existent. So if you want to have a contemporary and modern social media coverage of these um, of these politicians, you have to find a way of keeping track and keeping tabs on them. And imagine, in the German parliament, we have like a couple of hundreds um, members of parliament. How are you going to track all of these people on Facebook? Are you going to like all of their pages? <laughs> I personally, personally would have a problem of liking yep. uh, the pages of all of them. Not just because of the quantity, but there's some people that I don't really... Yeah, I don't want to like them, and I don't want to follow them. There's a, the alternative to the like. You can just click on follow, but it's not a very convenient way for you to track uh, whatever they're doing on social. So on CrowdTangle, you can have a list. They're curated lists, like pre-curated by the teams over there, and we work with many lists that we've created ourselves. So um, you might have one editor come up and say, okay, you know what, um, what about the um, Conservative Party in Germany, or yeah, or the CDU, for instance? Or the right-wing party. I'm sure none of you wants to like 10 right-wing people on Facebook. You're probably going to get many messages uh, <laughs> from your Facebook friends asking you what's Why? going on. <laughs> Do you need help? <laughs> so you can curate your own list and keep, a ta uh, to keep tabs on them. And then you can just browse through the list, see if there's anything unusual going on. You can sort um, the results by interactions to see what um, type of stories got so many reactions from people. But you can also just have a, chronic, a chronological review to see what was the last post of somebody from, le uh, from the list AFD in the past 24 hours. So that's a good way for you to just know what's up, be informed, and if somebody comes up, um, you don't have to um, say, okay, I don't, let me check for a second and go to the page of that person, but you can have it curated in your list. And I think this is a very helpful way of managing it. Great. Okay, we're almost out of time. I have one <laughs> final question. Yes. So what, what's the biggest challenge for you currently in your newsroom or that you see even more generally for social media editors? Mm -hmm. And if we could build something to help you with that, like, what would that look like? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> Brandon so, might kill me because yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just starting to build the product out here. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, I think the, one of the challenges for social media people is that we have to be on mm -hmm. at all times, right. especially if you're managing um, that department. It's, it's very hard to turn it off because yeah. something's always going on somewhere. So um, it's really about prioritizing. You have to, like nobody has time to just um, slack around and just look at things. You have to be very organized. We work with, like I have a gazillion of lists and to-do <laughs> lists. I could not live with my, uh, without my uh, Wunder list. Um, <laughs> the Germans will know, it's mm -hmm. a German startup. Yep, um, I use it. Yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> Yeah, so um, it's getting more and more and more platforms. It's noisier, it's noisier yeah. and you have new products coming out. And um, I do a lot of consulting within our company, so yeah. um, I have to yeah, be ready to give an assessment and say, okay, we're going to do this. We're, we're deciding not to be a part of that uh, particular new platform, for instance. Right. So this is, um, um, this is a huge part for us. And, yeah, so... Um, yeah, I think um, we have many challenges, and I think whatever, without being too specific, whatever can help us browse through the noise mm -hmm. and um, not have like so many singular steps Silos to, of, yes, yeah, yep. this will make our lives easier. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I just want to thank you very much for your time and thank everybody for being here. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, yes, sorry, you have a question at the back here? Um, just, just while we're waiting, um, one thing to note is that Brandon and I will be. Um, we have a, a cafe here in the in the Brufani Hotel where Facebook and CrowdTangle are. We have help desks 
where you can come and talk to Brandon and I individually and also Robin and Chris who are on our team are also here, um, as well as other Facebook um, team members. You can ask questions about any of the tools um, as well. Hi. This question is for Brandon and Asha, actually. Sure. So you talked about all these wonderful things that CrowdTangle can do, and I'm a fan, previously at the BBC, now at DW. But actually, there's something that we haven't talked about at all, and that is that women are represented in only 25% of media. This extends to 36% in North America and drops down to 18% in um, Africa, Middle East. Now, on Facebook, you can measure, actually, your gender split as well as your demographics. But it's very interesting that nobody measured that you can actually set the female audience as a target and work actively towards it. So what are you guys doing to kind of even that gender split and work towards a more even representation of women in the media? Um, yeah, I can, I can attempt it for a first. Sure. I'd love yeah. to hear your thoughts, too. Yeah. Um, so I'll speak, I'll speak specifically to what we can do from a tool end is, um, and this was not on a slide, but one of the things we're thinking a lot about is how to include more demographic data in CrowdTangle. Um, it's, I think it's one of the larger gaps out there when it comes to social data and audience data is um, you can see some of the demographic data at, ag at an aggregate level of your audience on Facebook, but it gets really hard when you're starting to look at either a post level or even the demo data for other audiences. Um, and I think by virtue of the fact that we're now at Facebook, um, there are going to be some opportunities to potentially explore that that weren't possible before. And uh, in all candidness, it's probably like one of the top three requests we've gotten since we built the tool is how can we figure out what different audiences, including underrepresented ones, uh, are consuming and how can we try and create content that's meaningful to them. Um, yeah. So it is, it's literally one of the things we're talking about right now and hopefully we'll be able to build some solutions for. Um, yeah. I know that doesn't answer the <laughs> newsroom part, but I probably can't speak to that as well as some others. Yeah, it's slightly like side note to that is that I've seen some of our partners creating really great lists around women on Facebook. So it might be um, one example that comes to mind since I'm in Singapore and covering um, Asia is like influential women in India, influential women in South Asia. And then the newsrooms, BBC being one of them who they're very good covering women um, issues, they will then track the content that's being shared by those pages on Facebook which will help them, it's not on the audience side to see who's actually consuming their content, but giving them story ideas and having a look at what's being shared more broadly. So I think, um, you know, that's available. I mean, you can do that now. Um, you just need to do a little bit of investment in creating the lists um, or, or doing searches around it. Um, but yeah. Thank you. I have one short question for Nadal. Nidal, um, yes. how's, hi. Hi, um, how's your newsroom acting on this article score? Now you have the metrics and mm -hmm. how are the journalists uh, working with <coughs> data? Yeah, so in our newsroom, as I mentioned, we're a very data-informed newsroom. So we have monitors throughout the newsroom with Chartbeat. I'm, I'm not sure if you know it. It's a a real-time analytics tool, so we always know where the traffic is coming from, we always know what articles are performing best. And this is not only for the online and social media teams, it's visible for everyone who's sitting in the newsroom. So um, what we've learned is that people get excited if they know that their story is the one that attracts people for, as I mentioned earlier, four minutes, and you have 8,000 concurrence on an article, that says something. So it's sort of, um, it's a rewarding feeling for the journalist to know that my story is actually being read right now. And every morning, this data, it's not only fragmented somewhere in different tools and some people use it or not and some people look at the screen or not. Every morning, the, um, our data and insights team sends an email also with the performance. And our editor-in-chief writes a morning mail every morning at 8.30. <laughs> yeah. Our online, um, head of, uh, online chief, Oliver Michalski, he writes the email. And you'll see the top and the flop stories of the day. So um, I think this really says something. And it says something about the mindset in the newsroom, to, And it has evolved so much. And now online is a it's like we're online first, digital first, 
and there's not one person that can say, okay, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to play, <laughs> I'm not going to be part of this. It's, um, there's no alternative to it. And that doesn't say that we're not, we don't care about our papers. No, we love our papers and we love our, our um, subscribers and we, we make sure that we have great content for them and a great paper every day and every Sunday with the Welt am Sonntag in the Welt. But it's important to track whatever's going on online and if your article is in the flop, you, you know and you see it and you, we have to do something about it and you'll see, it's not only top and flop, you will see exactly where the problem was. Maybe your article has gained great reach but people didn't spend a lot of time in it. Maybe your article had great social but the bounce rate and the engagement time was not, you didn't get a, a great score on that. So you'll see, okay, you, I can get 30 points every morning and then five points for every of the sections I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So you know, okay, I'm going to have to work on social. Maybe I go sit down with Nidal, talk a little bit about how I can, um, uh, what's the best way for me to tweet the story or um, what, how we can make sure that it gets posted on Facebook because we only post one third of our daily output on Facebook. Not every story gets put out. And um, this has various reasons because I spend a lot of time analyzing the Facebook algorithm and um, when many people are saying, oh, our traffic is going down and no nothing is working, Facebook has tweaked something, it's, I always tend to say, okay, please look at your performance. What are you doing? Did you change something? Are you spending enough time optimizing your content the best way? So it really gives you an indication of what area you really, really have to work on. Yeah. Thank you. I'm getting the cue that we're out of time. I'm yeah. so sorry, but we'd love to chat with all of you one-to-one. -one. Um, so please grab the three of us after. We'll, we'll head out and we're, we're going to go grab coffee in, um, in the Facebook cafe. So please feel free to come. Thank you, everyone, Thank for you. your time. Thank we you appreciate very much. It. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
is not, we should work with them, figure out how to allocate resources, how to celebrate wins, et cetera. Um, so the last one I'll also focus on is identifying your influencers. Um, for those of you who uh, are kind of writing and producing stories, uh, this thing happens every now and then where you get a massive amount of traffic from Facebook and you don't always know where it's coming from. Uh, what our system can do is show you if there are large third-party social accounts that are posting links to your content and driving traffic. Uh, this is our attempt to make up a fake version. Uh, this is a random Midwest Republican senator uh, who posted a link to an unknown story. Let's pretend this is yours. Uh, it will tell you when people are posting links to your content and make it really easy to sometimes understand where your traffic is coming from. And one of the things we did, that, did with this that's probably our most popular feature is we turned this into a Chrome extension. And what this means is you can be browsing the web on your own content, on other people's content, and you can immediately see how many social interactions a story has, and then literally what accounts across Facebook, Twitter, and even Reddit have posted links to that story, and then what they're saying about it, et cetera. Um, and this is really cool. One example of what you can actually do with this data is the Chicago Tribune uh, will take this, and if they see that somebody posts a link to one of their stories, they'll sometimes literally reach out to them and thank them for doing it, and in some cases form a partnership and figure out ways to work together because there's an, there's an immediate connection that their audience is interested in their content. Um, there's actually a bunch of stuff on top of this as well. Um, everything from kind of cross-platform analytics, historical data, easier reporting, um, and the one kind of theme for all of this is that a lot of you or other people on your teams used to do all this stuff, but you did a lot of this manually. And thanks to a lot of the work we've done and the solutions we try to provide, we try to make this much easier. Our biggest joy is when we take something that used to take a social media editor two hours every week to do, and we can make it take 15 seconds on a Friday before they go home. Um, the other thing I think we focus really hard on is we know how busy journalists are. Uh, so what we do is rather than trying to give you another dashboard that you have to log into every day, is we try to deliver this content in a bespoke model that meets you no matter where you are. Uh, Slack really took off in the US. I'm not sure how much it is integrated into European newsrooms at this point. Uh, but we built a whole Slack integration where this, uh, all this news and content be de delivered directly to Slack. There's completely custom email alerts. You can get all this delivered directly to your email. Um, and the other big one is you can also put these up in big screens in newsrooms. Um, so that again, you don't have to log into something new. You don't have to change your workflow. You can try to integrate this data into the natural kind of processes of a normal, normal news day. Um, great, so what have we been doing since we joined Facebook? And this is, if I could leave you kind of a second kind of key takeaway from all this. One is that we're trying to solve a lot of different data problems for newsrooms. The second one is that we're able to kind of do more than I think we could have ever imagined now that we're part of the Facebook family. So what's an example of that? Well, the first is that within a month of acquiring it, Facebook literally just made us free, uh, something we could not have done before. Um, it was really exciting. This was a part of the Facebook journalism project and a big investment by Facebook to help provide tools. One of the really big gaps out there was being able to see what was trending, what was working, what some of the kind of the best content and conversations were on social media. And that kind of slowly began the birth of what eventually became CrowdSangle. Um, so at its core, the basic problems that we're solving right now all stem from the fact that as journalists, as newsrooms, you're completely overwhelmed with data right now. Uh, most media outlets, most news, newsrooms are currently producing more content than they ever have before. You're more likely than not trying to distribute on more platforms than you have before. And if you're a journalist, you're oftentimes trying to listen to more sources and outlets than you ever have before. And it's incredibly hard. What we're trying to do in almost all of the various things we build is simplify all of those various processes in order to make it easy for you to use data to inform your work. Um, the goal isn't to have data drive your work, but if you're a newsroom, an outlet, a journalist, being able to make it easy so that data can inform the work you're doing. Um, we got started in the nonprofit world, but slowly began to be used by a lot of newsrooms. So leading up until the beginning of this year, we had the honor and privilege of working with a lot of great outlets around the world. Um, and in December of 2016, uh, actually got acquired by Facebook. 
Um, and one of the key takeaways, if I can leave you with during this whole presentation, uh, is that one of the reasons we were so excited about this is that prior to this, as a small startup, uh, we had a limited travel budget, uh, we had a very small team, uh, we had limited resources, we were scrappy, um, and there were a lot of products and solutions we also just couldn't build. Uh, because either one, we didn't have access to the data, we didn't have the time, we spent most of our time trying to sell deals, not build stuff. But by being inside Facebook, we're now in a position to be able to do a lot of things, including build a lot of products and solutions that we simply weren't able to before. Uh, and I think that's gonna mean a lot of exciting things for newsrooms and for journalists over the coming years. So how are newsrooms using CrowdTangle right now? Um, the truth is there's a lot of different ways. It's turned out to be a pretty robust platform after three years of continuing to add things to it. But there's three I wanna focus on today. Uh, one is discovering tor stories. Two is benchmarking your performance. And the third one is identifying your influencers. So discovering stories. Um, right now there's over 30 million posts per day that come from pages on Facebook. You may not necessarily care about every single one of those pages, but if you're a social media manager, if you are a content director, a journalist, chances are there's a lot of those pages that you do care about. And it's almost impossible to pay attention to everything they're doing. And that's to say nothing of Reddit, Twitter, all the other social networks out there. So at its core, one of the things we do is try and simplify and make that entire process really simple. This is a quick look at our dashboard. I won't go through everything here, but I'll show one thing in particular. Um, so what we do is let you follow all of the accounts you might care about. That could be your competitive set in a particular region. That could be third-party original sources like elected officials, candidates, government entities, et cetera. And we make it really easy to track everything they're doing. Um, and the one algorithm that's probably kind of the most widely used by all of our teams is this filter we call overperforming. And if you look at this number right here, I'll just go through this really quickly. This is a little in the weeds. Um, you can look at any post on any of the social networks we track, and what we can do is show you how every single post is performing. So this particular one from Fox 31, in this particular moment, this post came in one day ago, and if you look here, right now it has 146 comments, and that's 128 more than that outlet usually has after a day. So now if you're looking at any particular piece of content on all these platforms, not only do you see the raw number, you actually see how well that piece of content's doing compared to its average, and that helps you say, hey, this really resonated with the audience, or this didn't. It can help you find things on their way up, on their way down. It can help you discover best practices, et cetera. So what are some of the ways newsrooms can use this? One of the ones that we got really excited about last year uh, was a small newspaper in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, that was covering Hurricane Matthew in October of 2016. And what they did is they went into CrowdTangle and they actually added a bunch of good morning. Uh, I think we're gonna get started. Uh, so I'm uh, Brandon Silverman. Uh, I'm one of the I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of CrowdTangle. Uh, and just out of curiosity, how many folks in the room know what CrowdTangle is? Just raise your hands. Great. And how many people have never heard of it and are here just out of morbid curiosity? Okay, great. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do today is go through um, a few things. Uh, one is who we are and what we do at CrowdTangle, specifically some of the problems we're trying to solve for newsrooms and journalists all over the world. Um, secondly, uh, we were acquired by Facebook uh, at the very end of last year, and uh, I'm going to talk through what's been happening since then. Um, and then finally, uh, dive into a really specific example with local news. Um, and one context for this whole presentation, uh, so our team is based out of the United States. Uh, a lot of the work we've done started domestically in the U.S., but has been growing a lot internationally. Uh, some of the case studies of this presentation are U.S.-based, but one of the reasons we were so excited about joining Facebook is the opportunities it meant for us internationally. Uh, and so one of the things we're looking forward to this year and the coming years is growing more and more around the world. Um, and as a part of that, actually the second part of this whole presentation uh, is gonna be a case study uh, with uh, an awesome guest speaker from Velt N24 in Germany uh, and Asha Phillips from our team talking about how they use it. Um, so real quick, who are we and what do we do? Um, CrowdTangle's been around for about four years. Uh, it actually got started as a tool that was 
supposed to be used by nonprofits. Uh, and the original idea was we were, my co-founder and I were trying to hack the Facebook APIs uh, to connect issues and charities and nonprofits with their membership and their activists and their volunteers around issue areas they cared about. Um, I had spent seven years prior to this in the nonprofit world, and my co-founder had as well. Uh, it turned out that idea did not work at all. Um, but in the process of failing, uh, we were looking for lots of different ways to try and make it work and find things that resonated with our beta partners and early users. And it turned out 